The New York football giants keep hope alive on their 2024-2025 season with a road victory on the West Coast over the Seattle Seahawks. We dive in on all the stats that matter coming up next. Ah, yes, my friends, it's OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where you know that we are your host over here, Adam Armbrecht, over there, Andrew Makowitz. We're healthy, we're wealthy, we're wise, and we're feeling good. Why? Because the New York football giants get a 29-20 to road victory, 5-6 and six now, in Seattle over their last 11 meetings. So they are one of those rare road teams that can succeed on the West Coast. Andy, how are we feeling on a Monday morning when, frankly, whatever we thought this season could be, at least has some more hope renewed after a win for Big Blue. You know, it's it is really funny. The Giants are one of those roller coaster rides that you just can't seem to get off at any moment, Adam, where it's like just when you think that we know exactly what team we're gonna see or what to expect, you see something absolutely completely different than than what the expectations were. And it's been good or bad. <clears throat> where that we th- we feel confident the Giants could pull out a victory against someone like Jaden Daniels. They couldn't win that game. This game, I- I'm going to give you a second because I want to give you the floor on your victory lap. You predicted the Giants to win this game outright, which I thought was insane. When we were thinking about where the team was, no Malik neighbors, Devin Singletary looks questionable. I'm calling for a blowout from, from Seattle. I should have known better, Adam. Just when you think you have this team figured out, they do something completely different. And credit where credit's due. The Giants had a full team victory. We were just talking about it before the show. Uh, Literally a full team victory. It feels like you checked boxes across coaches, offense, defense. Like it felt like every single piece of it was clicking for the Giants, and that led to a road victory. No, 100%. And just before I get into my absolutely uh, victory lap, well deserved on my part, everyone knows it. Raise that up over your back and give two pats. Um, it, it is one of those things, as you just mentioned there, feels very much uh, Harry from Dumb and Dumber. Just when I think you can't get any dumber, you go do something like this and totally redeem yourself, right? Like you come off that game against Dallas and they're reeling and we should be able to get this win. And you do do that thing that we we talk about not wanting to. But then when the Giants win a football game and they are two and three, you turn around and go, remember that Washington game when you didn't have a kicker? Like all of a sudden you do look back on those missed opportunities and you mentioned the coaching staff as well, which I think has been critical. I will take the moment for that victory lap. The Giants got this road win. Most of that was predicated on looking back at the Seattle Seahawks and who they had played coming in and just kind of noting, listen, this is a team defensively that gives up points that you can move and score against on the offensive side of the ball. The Giants were able to do that in this game. And then ironically, with no Malik neighbors, with no Singletary, I made mention of Tyrone Tracy Jr. coming into this one, which we'll talk about. The other side of it was, I'll use the game that Andy, I thought, you know, would have come out of the gates referencing. Hey, listen, can the Giants win without a number one wide receiver in Malik neighbors? Yeah. Remember that playoff game against the Minnesota Vikings when it was who? Darius Slayton, Isaiah Hodgins, right? It was the other guys inside of that wide receiving core. So they were able to do that on this game against Seattle, much different. You didn't have a Saquon Barkley, but it turns out you have a rookie who is capable of doing some real damage in that game as well. So there's a lot of things that I think actually are interesting to talk about going forward for this team coming out of this game in terms of weapons that they can value and utilize. But on a high level, yes, I feel very good about saying the Giants could pull out this victory, get to two and three as we think about the ability for them to save this season. I, I don't want I do there's no negative slant to this, but doesn't this make oh, you so frustrated no. that you lose a game like to the Washington Commanders? You start going back in your head and you're like, man, it's a it's a it's a slippery slope because I'm so excited when you see what the team's potential is, even shorthanded back against the wall. They put up a performance like I did last night. So I'm trying not to think about what could have been, but there are going to be opportunities and the Giants are going to have to find them where they are going to be underdogs in a whole host of games that are coming up too, that they're going to have to make up some of those 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 miscues early on in the season. Yeah, and I'm going to look at this before we get a layer deeper as this is just the growth of a of an average team, of a team that has young players at a lot of positions, of a team that has a new defensive coordinator. We're going to talk about Shane Bowen here. Like, let's remember to not get into too much of the game details. 
But it was Isaiah Simmons who burst through the line and had a blocked field goal in this one that gets scooped up by Bryce Ford Wheaton for the touchdown, right? Like, so there are moments in this that, and it wouldn't have mattered, by the way. The Giants could have lost this game. And while we talk about the state of the season at that point, I would have still come out and said, hey, look at what we saw here, right? No Malik neighbor, still able to do a lot of good things, which we'll discuss uh, coming up here. Daniel Jones, Tyron Tracy Jr., Darius Slayton, right? Like there was a lot of things that were positive coming out of this game, but it did require little moments. So in the same way that it feels a little more brutal when you say no kicker, that hurts your chances against the team in the NFL. But I, I think that this all does kind of fall into the same pot, that if you took your big step back and you said the New York football giants through five games of the season, having played three on the road, having played against the Dallas Cowboys, and we didn't know coming in, but now when you look at the Minnesota Vikings, you look at Cleveland, that one feels different. The, obviously, the Washington game feels different with how Jaden Daniels is playing. To say that this team is two and three after starting 0 and two, by the way, you would have signed up for that. You know, we all would sign up to be where we are at this point. And I think that's all that matters. And that you're, you feel like, while it's, you mentioned roller coaster, it feels like the valleys are maybe getting a little bit shallower. And maybe the peaks were starting to trend in a way where the peaks can get a little bit higher. So I thought this was a good growth game for this team beyond the win in several key areas. And I want to get into that here as we talk about the offensive side of the football. Listen, I want we're going to talk Daniel Jones because it mattered a great deal. But when you get rid of or let Saquon Barkley walk in free agency, when you have Devin Singletary, who's looked OK at times and maybe has looked a little bit old at times for the Giants over the start of this season to go up against a bad or susceptible defense in the Seattle Seahawks to come off a game where you did not run the ball well and to turn around and get an 18 carry 129 yard two long run performances from Tyrone Tracy Jr. and effectively his first real opportunity as a rookie 12 carries averaging under two and a half yards a clip at this point of the season. That was, to me, nothing short of spectacular and, in a way, an opportunity for Joe Shane to say, there you go. That's one of the ones that I needed and I wanted and I thought could step up in a big way. I just, I, I love giving young guys their flowers when they do something incredible, and he was such a catalyst for this victory for the Giants. The Giants don't win that game on Sunday without Tyrone Tracy running the ball the way that he did. I mean, no. it, as well as, you know, Daniel Jones played, as well as the defense played, it felt like, he was the engine that kept these long, sustained drives going. He looked athletic. He looked – he had a commitment to every run where it was yeah. like he wasn't He wasn't going to stutter step and wait for holes. He was like, I'm just going to go where the play is dictating. I'm going to hit the gap, and I'm going to try to make a guy miss. And, Adam, it was it was refreshing to see Tyrone Tracy run, run the ball the way that he did. And, and like you said, <clears throat> this is his first time getting you know the lion's share of carries – and he delivered 7.2 yards per carry, long of 27, but it felt like he was getting chunk play after chunk play where the Giants just stayed ahead of the chains, was able to control time of possession by 15 minutes, almost a whole quarter more than the Seattle yeah. Seahawks did. And it, it, it's a direct correlation to Tyrone Tracy playing as well as he did. I have a question for you about okay. Tyrone Tracy. Uh, the, the, the thought that came to my mind was, well, two questions. One, are, are we ready to move – Tyrone Tracy in front of Eric Gray in terms of who's getting the snaps behind Devin Singletary when healthy. Well, he, here's why the answer is, is yes, because ironically, when we saw this a little bit, and I talked about it in preseason when we were saying about the roles in the backfield behind Devin Singletary, I said, you know, just, just remember, like, Eric Gray actually did do some pass catching in college. Like, I think we're underselling that part of his game. And then you go to this one and you're like, well, it's Eric Gray gets four carries, four yards. Like, we, we we know the travesty that that started this game on the uh, on that drive and made you feel like, oh boy, here we go again. And it is something that does speak to the defense and only giving up 14 total points after that massive scoop and score for the Seattle defense. But he had three catches for 50 yards on four targets, did Eric Gray. So it was like these their roles got completely flipped in this game. Tyrone Tracy Jr. had one catch for one yard. So yes, in that regard, I think the thing that was unknown was Tyrone Tracy's junior junior's ability, excuse me, to stay between the tackles if needed, to get the three, four chunk yards if needed. We, I, I know personally, I kept looking at him as, well, this will be interesting. You can line him up in the backfield with Devin Singletary and he can flex out, uh, you know, for receptions and then get him in space, et cetera. Instead, now it does look like he is very much the guy that you're going to put behind Devin Singletary. It's not only complimentary, 
but it also affords you the ability to say the defense is not going to assume what's coming when Tracy comes into the game. That's probably the biggest benefit of this one is signaling to the league, this guy's legit, full running back as a former wide receiver, and you're going to have to respect both aspects of his game. You know, I would even take it a step further. I'm there not going to be a prisoner of the moment, but I think Tyron up Tracy... On? No, I, I think Tyron Tracy has deserved a split in terms of the carries that the Giants should allocate into the backfield. No, no, no. I meant what I meant. Creeping up on Devin Singletary. You're you're thinking like, hey, based on what we saw in the last couple of weeks and based on what we saw yesterday, it'd be hard to not think he deserves that opportunity. Right, because you felt like it was more explosive. You felt like it was more dynamic. You felt like – and Devin Singletary is a guy that is tough, dependable, all the things that that Dayball and Shane look for in players – but he just doesn't have that explosive make a guy miss capability that someone like Tyron Tracy Jr. does. And that's not a knock. They can both complement each other well. I'm not saying all, all of a sudden Devin Singletary after one game isn't going to get on the field. But I think you feel the same way where it's like, hey, we see how explosive this rookie can be. And he's such a unique player because he's a little bit bigger. Obviously, we know he's a former wide receiver. It's just he has a different burst to him, a different wiggle than when I think what we're accustomed to. It was really refreshing to see Tyron Tracy run the ball the way he did. A hundred percent. And I and I think you're right. And guess what? When you don't bring back Saquon Barkley, and when you bring in a veteran like Devin Singletary, and then you also have Eric Gray there, and then you go and you get Tyron Tracy Jr. And you had Turbo Miller who got called up but didn't end up, you know, having an impact in this game. I know it would have been this would have been Andy's love fest if we if we had come in and heard, you know, Turbo Miller broke off a big one in this game. But when you go and do things like that from a GM perspective, from a coaching perspective. You know that if you want if you want the offense to continue to be dynamic, it's, well, what does Malik Neighbors mean, and then how do the players perform off of him? What does it mean to have Devin Singletary, a consistent engine and uh, engine to this team, and then can we get dynamic off of someone? That expands what the offense can look like, and that's what I think we got from Tyrone Tracy Jr. yesterday, and hopefully it's something that carries forward. Now let's talk about that QB. Daniel Jones, Andy, is a polarizing figure for the New York football Giants. <laughs> the you fan think? base, everyone has had those moments. We've all kind of come, you know, to that place where we know he's not the future of the franchise. We just want the ability to watch games on Sunday and not feel like, as we talked about last week, that he is the reason you might be losing games. There's going to be games when he plays neutral. There's going to be games where he helps you win. On Sunday, as Andy talked about before we started recording, you always go to the QB matchup. And can you outperform your counterpart? And guess what? Daniel Jones outperformed Geno Smith. And listen, Geno Smith threw the ball 40 times. He had 284 yards. He had that touchdown. But we'll get into that defensive side of the ball for Big Blue in a minute here. 23 of 34, 257, two touchdowns, no interceptions, a QBR of 72.3, a rating of 109.6, and... While we will not trend negative in today's episode, a couple of Wandale Robinson drops in big spots away from actually being a massive day and maybe a game where we're talking about the Giants going away comfortably in this one as opposed to playing down to that last possession. What were your thoughts on Jones in this one? I, I thought he was as crisp. I think I saw some other people write it online. I think that that was the best game that he's played since that Minnesota Vikings playoff game. It just felt like he was in total control. It felt like, he it felt like it was his last stand where he was like, I'm going to <laughs> run the ball, design runs. He ran yeah. the ball 11 times all with a bit of authority in yards. moments with a bit of like, you know, he put the shoulder down and earned the yards that you need him to get for the Giants to keep those drives going. Yeah, sometimes you feel like the guy would slide. It felt like he was like, I need every every inch of grass that I could possibly get in this game. And and that's why you, you mentioned why it's so polarizing being a Giants fan and rooting for this team, because you see situations like this where you can go on the road against a good I, – I still think they're a good team. I still think Seattle has yes, a good chance yes. of making the playoffs. All right, real quick, let me just say, like, I, you know, I, I called Seattle susceptible, but Seattle is not a bad team by any stretch. This is the kind of team that by the end of the year, you talk about them differently because of what they develop and how they progress on both sides of the ball. And really defensively, I think, can they shore that up a bit? But please, go on. Yeah, this this win was way better than the Cleveland Browns win. When you yes, look at yes, the good, good, good like, comp. Yes, out of the it, two it, wins – this one feels like something. Cleveland felt like nothing. Yeah, Cleveland felt like, okay, they they have limitations at their quarterback position, so we just, like, out – they outstruggled us in terms of, of losing that game. <laughs> this game, Daniel Jones, I thought, played better than Geno Smith, which is a huge compliment considering 
Geno Smith was leading the league in passing yards, and he has been slinging the ball all over the place. So here's the question I have for you about Daniel Jones. Is oh, yeah. what we saw against – yeah. Is what we saw against the Seattle Seahawks enough to, like, not make every game that Daniel Jones plays a referendum on whether or not he should be the starting quarterback? Yeah, that's a good – it's a good question, mostly because coming out of the Dallas game, you know, referendum or not, but I I said this coming into the year. I don't want to be long-winded, but coming into the year, I said, like, I don't want to have the conversation about what is Daniel Jones, what isn't he? He's the quarterback. It is what it is, and you have to ride with that. I acknowledge that coming out of the Dallas game and the way some of those missed throws and missed opportunities looked, you go, well, we do need to we do need to say it out loud right now. That, that this was a reason you lost this football game, and that's a problem. I think if we take the step back, it's okay to say, let's just watch this season and get, recenter ourselves on. Daniel Jones is the quarterback. The results are going to be the results. There are going to be some ups and downs, but that's okay. We don't have to make this Seattle game the reason that the contract made all the sense in the world. Right. Let's go to the playoffs. And we also don't need to take a rough performance from him and turn it into, well, that's why, and this is the problem, and do all of that backward thinking. So I, this game, I think, reminds you that Daniel Jones, by the way, had a big injury, and he's coming off of that. Whether or not some of the pop or the zip isn't there, will he get that back at some point this year? We don't know. But he performed at a very competent level in this game, above competency, I should say. Performed at a very high level in this game without his number one wide receiver. And if you take it in the season in totality, I think you can you can look and go, he can continue maybe to do things like this. Not every week against every defense, but there's a lot of matchups I can look on the schedule right now and say, oh, look at what they did in Seattle and start to try to duplicate that and then bring back in your number one like Malik neighbors and watch how that expands and grows things. You know, what I was most excited to see or most encouraged was just the touch that Daniel Jones had on some of those deep throws to Darius Slayton. It felt like, you know, the quote during the week where he was like, oh, you know, I underthrew, a, uh, I overthrew a couple early on. So then I underthrew it. You, I know, Adam, you hated that quote. What a six year quarterback. Ah, a little long, a little short, just trying to find the sweet spot. You're like, name any other six year quarterback in the league that comes down. He's like, I don't know, you know, 10 yards deep, five yards shallow. I'm trying to just dial it in a little bit, but. Uh, well, but funny, funnily enough, didn't it feel like he had it dialed in? He though? Dialed, like, I know, I, actually, I know. Like that's what, and this is another like mercurial, maddening, puzzling thing about it. It's like, oh, you just needed to recalibrate your your yeah. throws. Like, but I mean, there was a couple of those balls that he threw to Darius Slayton. One he dropped in the bucket off on the sideline, the one where they got Darius Slayton got the ridiculous 15 yard penalty, which should never be a yeah. penalty when you're just pointing for a first down. But even the, on the touchdown throw to Darius Slayton. You know, he waited, he he let the play progress. He threw it to only where Darius Slayton could get the ball. It was great. It was encouraging to see Daniel Jones play this way. I think deep down inside, everyone knows that he has this level of game in him. The issue is more, how often do we see it? What is, you know, how repeatable is this? If this, if we see this type of Daniel Jones every game for the rest of the season, the Giants will be in every single game in the fourth quarter with a chance to potentially win the game. And that's not hyperbole. It's just, that's the matter of fact, if your quarterback's throwing for 285, two touchdowns, running the ball well, good completion percentage, good passer rating, good QBR, like the Giants will be in it and Daniel Jones is the catalyst. Adam, I, I, I we can we can end there on the Daniel Jones piece. What I do also want to acknowledge on the offensive side of the ball still is what a game Brian Dayball called for the Giants on offense. That was a that was a work of art. They knew exactly what they needed to do. They knew that they had to have design runs for Daniel Jones. They knew that Tyrone Tracy needed to be more explosive than Eric Gray out of the backfield. They knew Darius Slayton had to be the guy, and, and they started incorporating Theo Johnson over the middle. Like Everything I think that they were thinking about in terms of play call, time of possession, it was a masterpiece. So I know we've been ultra critical sometimes of play calling or decisions that the coach or the GM have made. This one, this one, you got to give a standing ovation to Brian Dable for pulling out the win on this. 
Yeah, I want to turn my attention not only to Brian Dable, but then also to, to Shane Bowen and to the defensive, offensive, special teams, the coaching staff and how they performed in this game. I'll just button up that we are talking about a quarterback in Daniel Jones now with six touchdowns, three interceptions on the season. He's thrown six touchdowns, just one pick over the last four games after the season opener against Minnesota. So you go back and you start to look at his season and say, are we building in a positive direction where he can be? Oh, I love to use this one. Eh, a little false mu force multiplier over the course of the year, as Andy would want you to. But let's talk about that coaching staff and what they accomplished today. We came into this season, Andy, having curiosities about Shane Bowen and, and what was going to look different for this defensive unit coming out of the offseason hard knocks. And if you get Brian Burns, you get what you get and you don't get upset and no more groceries in the shopping cart, all of those proverbial cliches. And oh, by the way, Brian Burns came sweeping through late in this game on a designed pass play. They were trying to set up and absolutely engulf Geno Smith. And that was one of those go get the job done, right? Like go be that high caliber player that we went and traded for and gave a massive contract to. So you saw those kind of moments to start things on the offensive side of the football. And to your point, they, they mentioned that during the week, Brian Dable was asked, do you have any little plays or, you know, wrinkles that you want to throw at them? And Dable kind of laughed and said, yeah, we, we got something for them because that's part of what his coaching mentality is. He wants to every week put in some of those offensive wrinkles, things that the opposition will not have film on. And I do think in this kind of season, it does feel different. And while you'll never sit here and say you don't want to have your number one wide receiver or at least as of right now, your number one running back. It does create ambiguity for a defense where you go, so it's not going to be 15 targets to Malik neighbors in this game. We're going to have to look elsewhere. Now, ironically, inside of this one, you end up getting Darius Slayton, who does get 11 targets. Like, I'll give him his flowers at the end here. Let's stay focused. I, I thought the game plan made a lot of sense. What did you love the most about what Brian Dable did in this one? Before we talk about Shane Bowen, and we will close out giving some of those, you know, unheralded players a little bit of a tip of the cap in this one as well. Yeah, I, I love that. Well, I love a few things. One, obviously, the decision to go with I love, love. Tracy. Hey, I just I just love it all. I mean, what what, what do you want me to say? I I think oh, the, the, let me ask you a question here leading to Tyron. Sorry, leading to Tyron Tracy Jr. Do you think I, I still think this is a positive for Brian Dable that there was maybe an intention of using Eric Gray more, but that critical as we I heard Carl Banks, I was listening to him and Bob Papa on the radio for a lot of this game too, where he was like, You just you can't do it. No matter what choice you make, they're trying to get that last one inside the goal line, inside the two. If it had to be a field goal, it had to be a field goal to lose that football there. I think that was Brian Dable goes, okay, Eric, why don't you go ahead and just take it easy here? And then we'll see if Tyrone Tracy Jr. can take the ball and really run with it. Yes, and that, and that's part of the reason why I'm so, I don't want to say proud, but I am proud of Brian Dable for, for I think the game plan was to give Garrett, Eric Gray an extended amount of touches, and then he fumbles it at the goal line in the, in the most comical fashion on the planet. And he's like, we just can't have that. We got to go with someone else. We got, we can't have this happen. We know that Eric Gray has had some, you know, they tried him at punt return, punt returning. That didn't really work. And he got injured. I, I have my concerns about Eric Gray, but I want to kind of stay positive on the Tyron Tracy side. The giants pivoted. They said, let's go with Tyron Tracy. He started having the hot hand and they said, well, let's continue to do it. They were balanced on offense. They were ridiculously balanced. They ran the ball three times more than Seattle. Seattle only had 11 rushes to the Giants, 34 rushes. The Giants said, we are on the road in a hostile environment without our number one wide receiver. We need to lean on our offensive line. Our offensive line needs to be able to control the line of scrimmage, and they did. And so I, I know we are, we're all talking about Tyrone Tracy. I think the game plan from Dayball to say, we, have, we are healthy across the offensive line. We think we can impose our will. We are going to commit to running the ball. Even Daniel Jones. 11 runs, about three yards a carry. It was a commitment, though. They knew that they needed to eat clock, get positive plays, and then ask Daniel Jones and others to make big plays when it counted. And Darius Slayton made the big plays. Theo Johnson did. Even Eric Gray made, made that big catch. And so for yeah. me, I just love I just love everything that I saw from the coaching staff. And like we, we don't do that very often where we give the flowers to, to Brian Dable. I thought he did a tremendous job. And I think, you know, the course of the season we talk about, well, is it the games when you feel like Daniel Jones is, is not quite checking the boxes you need him to? Does that restrict or limit Brian Dable to continue to open up the playbook and to kind of have that game script? Like, I think this was also a game where in spite of the fact that you have that Eric Gray fumble and you give up the touchdown, 
the Giants came right back in that. And you could see what the plan was and getting back to seven to seven and, you know, getting right back into the flow of this game from a scoring standpoint, I think really mattered. By the end of the second quarter, we're talking about, well, it's 10, 10 at the half, not, you know, Giants down now 13, three, because that one drive didn't work out and you couldn't find the same mentality. So the ability to stick to the game script might matter more for Brian Dable and for the Giants, as opposed to, you know, the Kansas City Chiefs haven't been the perfect team this year and they're suffering their own injuries. But I think about them where it's like, okay, two drives didn't quite go the way we wanted. Mahomes threw a pick on this one. We had to punt on that one. But there's always this sense of we've done this a thousand times. We'll crack the code here eventually. Whereas for the Giants, it's, well, we've done this a thousand times negatively. We fumbled the ball on the goal line. We've given up bad turnovers. We've fallen behind in games, and then you feel like you're chasing your tail. So I think that's also something you carry forward here for the Giants. Game script matters for them week over week. Then the fact that they were able to make the big mistake, recover from the big mistake, and then effectively reset yourself at halftime and then come back out and say, okay, can we navigate through the second half? Remember, it's 19-10 overall. Again, touchdown there at the end of it on the scoop and score. But you're really looking at a team that was able to go toe and toe and continue to match. And once they got the lead, hold on to that lead. And that flips us over to the defensive side and to Shane Bowen, who I thought has done a really good job. We, we may be looking back here. We're already having this discussion. The thing that gets kind of fallen by the wayside for the Giants, Andy, has been that in these games. So now you look back at the Vikings when you go 28 points. Well, it wasn't good, but they're also a very good team. You go and look at the commanders and what their offense is doing. You say 21 points. Oh, that actually may go down as one of the better performances against that offense. The Browns is its own standalone. 15 points looks good. Only 20 points, even against a team like Dallas, who has their own struggles. I just, I think we're kind of entering this sweet spot where we understand the secondary has its problems. Listen, big swat away by Deontay Banks in a critical spot against DK Metcalf. We're going to take anything that we can get in terms of him trying to find his footing on this season. Shane Bowen now has two games. We weren't sure what to make of the Cleveland one because the Cleveland offensive line was banged up and their offense is bad. This one, though, seven sack performance, sexy Dexy, Brian Burns, right? All of those elements. Now you can start to say it looks like Shane Bowen is starting to find his fingerprints on this unit. And we can we can look at it and think this defensive front is capable of being impactful enough, consistently enough, where it can mitigate some of the risks we know we have on the back end. You know, just like we thought, five games into the season, the New York football giants would be leading the league in sacks. Just like you drew it up. Like, how how could how could it be anything other than that? Right. It, I mean, it, it is shocking to me how how much there has been progression given the limitations I feel that we have some somewhere in the secondary, some of the injuries that we've had. But today the boys came to play. Dexter Lawrence was unbelievable. Like I, we keep running out of superlatives to, to say about Dexter Lawrence because he just impresses, but a nose tackle shouldn't be getting three sacks. Like that's just not a thing. And listen, I, I feel like Chris Jones, Dexter Lawrence, I've got like, he's not at the Aaron Donald level yet that they need to have some playoff success, but Dexter Lawrence is a game wrecker from the defensive line position that we have not seen in a very long time. It is exciting to see him getting pressure up the middle changes the the offensive's uh, approach and scheme and what they have to do to be able to block him. Then all of a sudden you're saying, well, good luck going one-on-one -on -one against Brian Burns. Good luck going against Kayvon Thibodeau one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, and we may bring safety help to come in there or blitz you at any moment. And a guy yeah. like Jason may lead us in, in sacks. It is, it is impressive knowing that there are holes on this defensive side, how well Shane Bowen's defense has held up. And, you know, we were, uh, I think I was sl slightly critical um, earlier on in the season, especially against the Vikings, but it feels like they're rounding into form. Everyone is playing together. And if this is the expectation and the Giants are going to give up just under 20 points a game, they're going to be in every single one of these games. And so it's really funny. It's like, if the defense plays this way, the Giants will be in, in every game. If Daniel Jones plays the way that he did, the Giants will be in every game. Can we get both of them happening at the same time on a consistent basis? then the Giants are going to win more games than they lose. And that is like the ultimate question, I think, that is on every Giant fan's mind. Yeah, coming out of this one, I think that's a really good way to frame it. Like, if you can get consistency defensively, and you can get that pressure to alleviate the secondary, your defense can hang in games. The, the Seattle Seahawks offense is good. 
Like they are a solid unit. There's more that we'll talk about as this week progresses and what they were able to accomplish when you look at this 29-20 victory, which again was very much back and forth, very much even tempoed on both sides of the ball. And yet you turn around and you see while you end up with that Geno Smith, obviously, you know, 32 yard run, he does the damage. Five carries for Kenneth Walker, only two for Charbonnet. Like there was a stymieing ability for that defensive front there. Combine it with Daniel Jones in the offense playing consistently. Be in football games. That's all, that's all you want. Be in games with opportunities to win. And you and I talked about these next four games for the Giants and whether or not could we squint and see a world based on the results early in the season and maybe getting a recalibration on where some teams are. I don't know what I'm going to make of the one and four Cincinnati Bengals coming to town next weekend, right? And then the Philadelphia Eagles and closing, obviously, on the road with the Pittsburgh Steelers inside of that next four game bracket. But there's a lot across these first five weeks to suggest they can be in the mix in these games. And that's something that I don't think coming into the year you and I would have said over a lot of these matchups. You go through the schedule, you say, Okay, well, after these seven losses, what can the Giants do, right? What can they accomplish? This was a really good sample size. It was a really great performance. I still want to talk about the receiving core and Darius Slayton more. We still want to talk about the defensive unit and what we saw from Deontay Banks in this game and how players are trying to progress on an individual level. So much more that we'll get into throughout the course of this week. And that's why you got to get us on YouTube. You got to get us over on your podcast feed. Support those sponsors if you can. Go ahead and get the downloads, turn on the alerts, give us a glowing five-star review, please, if you dare. But until the next time, Andy, until the best times, following a New York football Giants victory, as you would want, need, and nay, demand the people know. As always, let's go Big Blue. 